Good morning, Foundations Church. Hey, before we start, can I, let's leave each other in prayer this morning. Dear Lord, we just come to you this morning and we ask that as we uh, progress into the part of this service where we read your word, that it will enlighten and open our hearts, and that ultimately we will see more of you through these texts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Pardon me, I've had no water this morning. So as you can see on the screen there, we are in Matthew chapter 13. So if you have a Bible with you, turn there <laughs> to verses 44 and verses 52. Um, and as you make your way there, I'll recap where we've been so far so that we're kind of on the same page. So um, from the beginning of the year, we've been looking at Matthew. This is the book that we've been going through, through different parts of the year. And so we've heard a lot about the book of Matthew thus far. But what really started it after we came back from COVID uh, was when we, we kind of did the backwards thing where we started at the end and then we've sort of been enlightening the middle and the end. Um, I don't know how many of you watch films. I, I have a degree in film, so that's kind of one of my things. Um, but there's this filmmaker named Quentin Tarantino, and I'm by no means advocating that you go watch any of his films. Uh, that would not be the Christ-like thing to do. <laughs> However, um, he has this tendency to tell a story over a period of times and ways, and he interweaves the end and the beginning and the middle to bring light to the main core of the subject, and that's kind of unintentionally what we're doing here. So several weeks ago, we started with Matthew 28, and that's the end of the book of Matthew. That's where Jesus, right before he ascends into heaven, gives his final word to the disciples. And in it, he gives them an imperative. He says, go make disciples, right? And so we talked about what that meant, what it meant to be a disciple of God, right? A lot of people think that it simply means I come to church and therefore I am a disciple of God, but that is not actually what the word disciple means. Disciple is a person who has given up their life to learning, it's a scribe, someone who is willing to lay down their life for a purpose and a call and for the purpose of learning more about something. And in this particular case, about the kingdom of heaven. And so for the last several weeks since then, we've been sort of dissecting what the kingdom of heaven is. Why? Why on earth would we give our lives up for that? And it's very well stated in the parables, which is what we've been looking at for the last two weeks, where Jesus introduces this teaching device called the parable. And the parable is sort of a loaded language, right? You can look at it. You can read it. You can hear what it has to say and never get the point. But if you have ears that hear and eyes that see what is written and what is said, is something different than maybe you would have perceived if you didn't. And so what I mentioned two weeks ago is that the disciples, the ones who were with Jesus, got the enlightenment that the crowd didn't have. And so there's a crowd, there's a group of people who are gathered to hear Jesus talk, yet they have no idea what Jesus is talking about. They think they hear something, but in reality they don't hear anything. The disciples, the 12 who've wandered around with Jesus as he takes his ministry out, are the ones who actually hear the words of God for what they are. And so we are here. We're looking at the last four parables that Jesus gives in this particular section of Matthew. And um, I'm hoping the screen works because I have a lot of references in Matthew that we can look at together to kind of enlighten this. Um, and if it doesn't, you're just going to be flipping those Bibles back and forth. So I hope you have one that's ready to spring open. But for, <laughs> for that, let's start here in Matthew chapter 13. And we're just going to read verses 44 through 52. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. 
the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I'm going to pray over you guys again because this one is going to get intense. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning and we ask that as we go through these passages, as we look very intently and closely at the words that you have spoken to us, that we will not miss one part of it, but rather we will be grafted into your kingdom and we will be made disciples who become the masters of the house, those who are willing to teach and to bring others into the net. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So I'm going to give you a few things that we're going to look for. First, we're going to find out what the kingdom's value is. So we're going to look at the value of the kingdom. We're going to look at the response upon the revelation of the kingdom. So when the kingdom is presented, what is the proper response that we should have to it? Then we're going to look at who gets to go into the kingdom. And then finally, we're going to look at all of that information accumulated and see if we are a part of it, what are we supposed to do? And it's all clearly laid out right here. We just have to have eyes that see. So first and foremost, I want to start off with a little bit of a story. I don't want to delve too far into that, but we'll, we'll go from here. I think it's kind of related. Uh, my children, one of their favorite books right now is Old Man in the Sea, which is an Ernest Hemingway novel. I don't read them the actual thing, obviously. It's not conducive to little children. However, um, I have this abridged version with pictures, and they, they like it. Um, the story is about a man named Santiago, and Santiago is this gentleman who... Uh, for whatever reason, in his older age, has just become a not-so-great fisherman. It just happened. He's, he's gone on a streak without catching a single thing. Um, but he befriends this little boy, and this little boy, Manolin, kind of encourages him to go out. Go fishing, man. I know you were great at one point in time. Go fishing. And so what he does is he encourages him to go, and finally he goes out on this journey. And if you've ever read this story before, you know that he actually catches a fish. It takes him several days to catch it. He toils through the night to get to it. And in the end, he catches this giant marlin that no one has ever seen. It's the elusive, huge marlin that he's been chasing after, right? And uh, I'll end it there. I don't want to go too far. Well, I'll go a little further. The, 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 he ends up tying up the marlin and carrying it back in his little boat, and then sharks eat it, but he carries it back anyway. Yikes, I gave away the story. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> But the point is, is he, he goes out intently on this purpose, and this might be his last mission, right? This might be his last thing, and he goes out in search of this fish that he has to have, this treasure of the sea, and he's intent on catching it. He's intent on going after it, and he finds it. And what we see here are two different people in these first two parables. We see one who stumbles upon the kingdom of heaven, and then we see the other who is kind of like Santiago in the fact that he is searching desperately for something and stumbles upon it. But you'll also notice that their reaction is the same, and that's what Jesus is trying to make here. So the first, the first verse that we go to, verse 44, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up, then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So we could go on and on about why this man is in the field in the first place. Maybe he's cutting through. Most likely, and this is what most scholars would think, is he's actually working in the field. So this is someone else's property and he's working in the field. So he's a hired worker. And what he's doing as he's working, he stumbles across a treasure. Now, uh, I know that buried treasure is not something that you would typically think of finding today. It's sort of a pipe dream. It's sort of a mystery of pirates. But back in the day, there were no banks. So it was actually easier to hide your treasure in your dirt somewhere. Uh, so it's actually a realistic thing. <laughs> so this man stumbles across a treasure. And notice what he does. He covers it up. What's that about? Well, obviously, um, if you were... Of, a, of the faith before, if you were Jewish, let's think about it from this perspective, you would know that you're not supposed to steal, right? 
So he covers it up and he goes and he buys the property from the person. He, he sells everything he has for whatever this treasure is. So first and foremost, let's establish this. The kingdom is of such great value, it's priceless, is what Jesus is getting at, that he sells all that he has and buys the field. So the kingdom is essentially priceless. The treasure is the kingdom. The kingdom is the treasure, right? Go from there to there. And so he goes home, he accumulates all of his wealth and sells everything. I want you to imagine going into your house, right? And literally itemizing and listing everything on, uh, in our modern context, let go, right? You know, like, oh, this lamp, I can sell this lamp. Oh, this bookshelf, I can sell my bookshelf. Oh, this stack of old um, silverware, I can, I can sell that. Selling every single piece of who he is, including the house, to buy this property. That's how valuable the kingdom of heaven is. It's worth giving up everything for. Now, there's something more to it than just selling your stuff, right? There's something much larger to that. You see, the things we accumulate say something about our identity. They say something about who we are. This is more important than the actual things that we own. See, as we accumulate wealth and we accumulate things, the things that we have in our homes say something about what we care about the most. And the things that we care about the most become almost like an idol to us. They become other gods, if you will. And so when we are purging those things, we are saying that these things are of lesser value than God. And therefore, we are going to give everything we have for it. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to look at verses 19 through 24. And I think I have it up there. I think I do. So I'm going to do something today. I'm going to use Matthew to illuminate Matthew. So you're going to start to see this theme continuously played out through Matthew. That the theme is the kingdom of God and its intrinsic value. So in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19... Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither, neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And if you skip down to verse 24, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. And Jesus, just to clarify himself, says, You cannot serve God and money. Very literally saying to them, You cannot serve it. Thank you so much. That helps. <laughs> so we lay up our treasure in heaven. And where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. And where our heart is, is where our treasure is. So if our heart is where our possessions are, then that's where our treasure is. And that's where our God is. And so the man who sold all of his possessions for the field wanted to possess the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so to bring more light to this, let's continue back in Matthew 13. We're going to look at verses 45 and 46 now. And so this is a parallel pa parable. This one goes hand in hand with the other one. But it's a slightly different person. In verse 45 it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. And the story ends there. A merchant is someone who buys and sells by trade, right? So they're constantly looking for the latest and greatest thing, or in this case, the latest and greatest pearl, or pearls. Their job is to buy and sell. But what's interesting about this one is he finds one that is of such great value. He's sort of like the Santiago off of the sea. He's finally found the fish. He's found the one. And it's of such great value that he goes and he sells all the other things that he has for it. And it just ends there. He bought it. It doesn't say that he tried to sell it again, or tried to pawn it off on someone, whatever it was, was of so much value to him that his entire profession stopped. His occupation was a merchant. He was selling, he was buying and selling, and at this point in time, he stopped. 
This pearl was of such great value that his identity changed. The same with the person in the field. He stumbles across a field and he goes from being one working the field to being the proprietor of the field. Do you see where I'm going with this? We go from being the worker to the inheritor. And so my second point here is this. The revelation of the kingdom requires something. It requires giving up everything. I'm not going to have you turn there, but there's a parable. Well, actually, I will have you turn there in a minute, but I'll I'll give a breakdown of it. There's a story in, in Matthew about a rich young ruler. And he comes up to Jesus in a sort of pompous way and asks, how can I inherit eternal life? How can, I, how can I inherit eternal life? Not how can I find the kingdom or how can I follow the Messiah? How can I inherit eternal life? You see the problem with that, that question. He asked him how he can inherit it. And Jesus runs by all of the questions of the law, you know, and then gives him one final thing after he has said that he, is, he has done essentially what is impossible, which is follow the law. He gives him one final one. He says, okay, go sell all your stuff and follow me. The key isn't selling all that stuff. The key is get rid of your burdens to follow me. You're not going to be able to follow Jesus if you have a camel full of treasures lugging you down. And so Jesus is saying, no, sell your possessions, or let me be more clear in what Jesus is saying, get rid of your idols. What are idols? Well, In our modern context, they can be work, they can be religion, they can be entertainment, it can be social media, it can be news, it can be anything that consumes you and your time so much more that you care more about it than the kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying very clearly, purge that from your life. So actually, let's turn there. Let's look at Matthew 19. And I'm going to show you the end of this, and then I'm going to kind of illuminate it a little more. And again, I told you, you'd be bouncing around a little bit today. Brace yourselves. So this this is, it starts in verse 16, but we're going to read a little further because I just paraphrased it for you. So we'll start in verse 22. So again, this is after Jesus has told him to sell all of his possessions and follow him. And it says in verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I want to make a little note here. Do you possess something or does something possess you? Think about that. So in verse 23, And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. I want to make another note because this is one that scholars have debated the intention of. There is a place in Israel that some people call the eye of a needle. It's a tiny little hole that supposedly... A camel could hypothetically move through if it had removed all of its stuff. But the reality is, is he means this literally. He means the eye of a needle. The camel ain't going through there. In verse 25, he says, When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? That's a fair question, right? But geez, man, if this guy can't get in, he was righteous. He did everything by the law. Why can't we, who who can, what can happen? He says in verse 26, but Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Still doesn't really answer the question. We know that God is good and God can do all, but I mean, come on, who can be saved? In verse 27, we see our favorite character, Peter. Then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you, What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So that is a prophetic thing for the twelve apostles. But then here is where we get to. Verse 29, this is for us. It says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. 
You see, Matthew is pretty intent about the kingdom of heaven. It wants you to know who, who brings it, who's in it, what is the kingdom of heaven. And you'll see this word, this phrase used over and over again. The first will be last and the last will be first. You see, those in this life who have it good, as we call it, will be last. Because the chances are the things that they value as good are in the way of God. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. It's because those who have not crave the thing that they can't have. They crave God. And so what he's saying in this particular passage is not that the rich young ruler couldn't inherit the kingdom. It's that he wasn't willing to inherit the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus speaks to the disciples in verse 18. As soon as he starts his ministry, he's come out of the wilderness. And in verse 18 in Matthew chapter 4, it says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And this is the key word of this phrase, verse 20. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Immediately. Without even second-guessing it, they said, "Ah, yeah, this fishing business isn't working out for us. We're going to go be fishers of men. To take it a step further in this passage, verse 21, it says, And going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, the sons of thunder, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. We have people giving up their entire occupation and their lives and their families for the kingdom of God. That's why they're sitting on 12 thrones. And before you think, okay, well, that was to them. That was to a particular time period. That was to one select group of people. Well, then why in the end did Jesus say, go and make disciples? They were disciples. We too were called to the same purpose, to give up all we had for the kingdom of God. I'll be completely frank and honest with you. I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for God. If God didn't reveal himself to me in some capacity, there's no way. I even told him that when I was a kid. There's no way, I'll, there's no way man, I'll be preaching. <laughs> and here I am. It's almost like when you tempt him, that's when things just like, they come back at you. But I remember, I remember distinctly saying, there is no way that I am going to be doing this. No way. No way. And then I remember the moment where I read Isaiah 43 and I was crying. Because everything that I had tried to run away from was written in that passage. Everything everything that I had somehow tried to escape from. And I knew that my life had to radically change. And am I totally sanctified? No, but I'm on my path, man. I'm on my path. And so the two things that we are at right now here is the kingdom is the most precious treasure in life. There's nothing greater than it, right? There's nothing, absolutely nothing greater than the kingdom. It's worth selling everything that we have. And so the revelation of the kingdom requires giving up everything. And so as I go into this next section, I'm going to say something that for some of you might be controversial, but it's the truth, and it says it right there. Verse 47 It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So in the last three parables that I've read, I want you to notice something after the word, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus does not say this in a future tense. He does not say the kingdom of heaven will be. He doesn't say the kingdom of heaven that is coming. He says the kingdom of heaven is. That's a present tense. The kingdom of heaven is currently here. At the end of Matthew 28, as I quoted earlier, 
Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples in my name, right? Teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom is here. A lot of people think of that, or don't think of that, and think simply when Jesus returns, that is when the kingdom will be here. But no, 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 no. The kingdom is here now with Christ. It started with Christ the moment that he was baptized and started his ministry. The kingdom began. Now it will be fulfilled when he returns. But the kingdom is already here. It's already started. And you are disciples of that kingdom. So now that you know that, it's time for us to live like we are in the kingdom and not like we are in the world that we are in. And so the kingdom here now is gathering saints. It's gathering saints. It's building the body of Christ. And so it says the kingdom of heaven is like a net. The New American Standard says a dragnet. So a big, giant net that goes behind a boat and it just catches everything in it. And this is what Pastor Mitchell talked about last week. There's the wheat and the tares, right? There's the good and the bad growing right beside each other. In the kingdom, the kingdom is right now. There is good and bad together. And this net does not discriminate. It's just saying, come on, get in everything. It gathers the fish of every kind. Good fish, bad fish, the ones that you would eat, the ones that were kosher, and the ones that were not. The eels. <laughs> Nobody wants those. I mean, unless you like sashimi, I guess it's cool. But notice how the, 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 it changes here in verse 48. It says, when it is full, right? So the kingdom is at hand, but when it is full, meaning when the fullness of the world has seen the revelation of Christ and either chosen or not chosen, or the way I prefer to refer it, has either been chosen or not chosen, Then men will draw to shore and sit down and separate good from the bad. So it's only when all of it's been caught, everything in the sea, or every person has heard the word of the gospel, then what will happen is Jesus returns, and that's when the sorting begins. It says, so it will be at the end of the age. The literal translation of end of the age is actually the consummation. I love that term. If anyone knows what that means... It is a very intimate term. A consummation is when two people come together as one for like the first time at the wedding, right? It's when they are united. We think of Christ as our head. We think of the church as the body. Well, they're kind of sort of existing, but they're sort of disconnected. When the consummation happens, then the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So when he returns... I'm going to get in trouble. Don't hold back, hold back. When he returns, judgment will happen immediately. He will bring about judgment immediately because he's purging what is left for the new heaven and the new earth. So there will no longer be this disconnect. If you've read in your Bible the book of Genesis, you'll know that at one point in time, God was literally in the garden with Adam and Eve. The whole point of this book is to get us to the point where the Edenic state is again, where we are in communion with God and there's no barrier of here and there. That's why there's a new heaven and a new earth. And so when Jesus returns, he's going to purge everything that cannot exist in that place. And that's unfortunate for anyone who chooses not to be in it, who didn't hear the call or who heard the call and refused it, who continued to live a life of sin. But the reality is this, unless you repent and turn that's the, the key. Return, then you won't be in it. And so we see two things here, and I'm, I'm pulling together verse 43, which we didn't read, but we will in a second. And this verse here, we see that the angels will come out and will separate evil from righteous and throw them into fiery furnace, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we have one person who's glorified, and we have one person who is condemned. In verse 43, it says, if you go up just a little hair before, it says, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. According to Romans 8, like we saw earlier, you will be conformed to the image of the sun. I love that verse. 
because that makes me feel so happy to know that slowly over this period of life, I'm being conformed not to look like this wretched soul that I am, but rather to the good, good God that gave his life for us. And it is saying that the righteous will shine like the sun. We will be conformed to the image of Jesus in the kingdom of their father. We will be adopted as sons and fellow heirs of a kingdom. Oh my gosh, how can you not be excited about that? But we have to first grasp the fact that the kingdom starts now. You have already been redeemed. You've already been justified. And you're being sanctified. So one will be glorified. That is the saints. That is the disciples who have given up their life for God. The other will be condemned. It says in verse 50, he will throw them into the fiery furnace. In their place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is an allusion to Daniel, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into a fiery furnace. The difference was God was on their side. In this case, not so much. I want to take it a step further. If you turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. In verse 31, it says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. I don't know if you've thought about that passage very much, but sheep were the desirable thing especially in the terms of sacrifice, right? Take it a step further, goats could be used in a sacrifice, but then there was also this weird passage uh, in the Old Testament where one was sent out as a scapegoat to a demon called Azalel. So they're saying, look, the sheep are the desirables. The goats are not. Jesus will separate the two. He will take the good fish and he'll throw out the bad fish. In verse 46 of that same passage, verse 25, it says, And those will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And so the kingdom is this treasure that we inherit. And on top of that, we inherit eternal life. But we inherit eternal life in one way or the other. (laughs) In the kingdom, which is glorious and beautiful, or in eternal hellfire, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so what's interesting going forth into this last little section of these parables is the position that the disciples have got. If you remember two weeks ago, I said the disciples did not understand what Jesus was saying. They asked him privately. They wanted to know more about what he was talking about. But now they're starting to get it. And it could be because they just used the fisherman reference. And as we just mentioned before, they were prior to this fishermen. It says in verse 51, Jesus speaking to them said, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. So so confidently, yes, yes, Jesus, we we get it all now. And if you've read Matthew, you know that they don't totally get it yet, uh, that the Holy Spirit has to help them inevitably get it. But but as for now, we know that they now are seeing. Their eyes are now seeing. It's the beginning of something new. They're no longer blind, but their eyes are seeing and their ears are hearing. So they said to him, yes. And so then what he does is so interesting. And I, I like, the more I read about this and the more I read it over and over again, I found it sort of interesting. Rather than just letting that be, Jesus then gives them another parable. He's like, okay, yeah, yeah, you got it. So here, let me give you another parable. Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. So he's like saying, hey guys, now that you see See this. And so what he says is, therefore, every scribe, and this is one of the only instances in Matthew where scribe is used in a positive way, because usually the scribes are those of the law who are in opposition to Christ. But here, they're actually good. Therefore, every scribe. Now remember, the disciple, what is a disciple? Does anyone remember? Someone who is a scholar, right? Who has studied 
under someone, under someone's tutelage. They have followed them around. They've studied their words. So a scribe is essentially a scholar. Therefore, every scribe or every disciple who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house. So if you've been trained for the kingdom of heaven, which you have, you are a disciple. And not only are you a disciple, but you are a master of a house. As it says in Romans, you are fellow heirs with Christ. You are a master. And so then what it says is you bring out your treasure, what is new and what is old. So he says, look, if you've been trained, your duty here then is to bring out these things so that others see it. Notice how the new comes first before the old in the phrasing. Bring out the new to enlighten the old. The scribes used negatively in Matthew would have only seen the old. They would have only seen the law. They would have only seen the Moses and prophets. And they were blind and did not have sight to see Christ in everything. But these people, the disciples, the apostles, they saw Christ in everything. And so as masters of the house trying to entertain guests and show them how gracious and loving this place is and welcome them, it is their duty to bring out their treasure, keyword there, their treasure, which is their knowledge of the kingdom of heaven. And so disciples become teachers. That's what it is. The command at the end says, go therefore and make disciples, teaching them. They become teachers. And their job and their duty is to bring out all things so that Christ is preeminent in all things. So no matter what walk of life you're on, your duty is to make sure that other people see Christ in you and through you. And so the kingdom is the most precious treasure that we can possibly inherit. And whether you've stumbled upon it, like the man in the field, or whether you've gone searching for it, you must give up everything you have for it. If you truly want to have it, you have to let your old self die. As Galatians 2.20 says, you have to be crucified with Christ and raised with him as a new being. As John 3.16 tells us, we must be born again, made new. Jesus is the firstborn of the new life, the new And so we have been brought up new into this new kingdom and this new house. And as disciples, our job is one thing, to take our net, to throw it out into the sea, to catch as many fish as we can, and to make sure those fish are good. So the question here then is, how many of you are bringing Christ into the world? How many of you are truly living for Christ? Or how many of you still have some of your old treasure lying around in your heart? I say that because once Christ becomes preeminent, once he becomes everything in your life and you see it, once you have the eyes that see and the ears that hear and the heart that believes, and he turns your heart of stone into a heart of flesh, it is impossible for you to not Show it and share it. Again, I am the testimony of that. I wouldn't be up here if it wasn't for, if it was for my own will. And so if you have seen the kingdom, if you have had a foretaste of what is to come, that new heaven and that new earth, then you, as a disciple, go out and preach the word of God. Preach it in your jobs. Preach it on the street. Preach it to your family and to your friends. Take it everywhere you possibly go. The good news that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. And we will be forever made glorious in his presence. You tell me one thing on the news that's greater than that. You tell me one thing on your social media feed that makes you feel happier than that. Maybe a sloth eating a carrot? Nah, I don't think so. But seriously... My charge to you today is to die to yourself, to let yourself go, to go home and purge yourself of the idols that you have, and to follow Jesus, as the song we sang earlier said. Decide to follow Jesus. 
Give him your heart. Give him everything he has because he is worth it. He is the finest pearl in the sea. He is the finest treasure in the field. He's the most glorious thing you will ever lay your eyes on. And we haven't even seen him yet. We've just heard his word. And so this morning, I ask you to turn to him, to pray, to open your heart to being used in ways that you never thought were imaginable, to ask the Holy Spirit into your heart to lead you and guide you so that when you see the kingdom, you become the kingdom's best salesman. Let's take our nets out this morning and let's catch some fish. Let me pray for you guys. Most glorious Father who gave his Son to us and for us, we give you thanks. We know that your Son is preeminent in all things, that he is the firstborn of the new, and that we, as fellow heirs of that kingdom, long to be in your presence. And knowing what we have, just a foretaste of it, Lord, we ask that you will empower us to take this message out so that no one that we know will not have heard the gospel, the good news of Christ, that our brother in you is there for us and with us. I give you thanks for every person in this room, Lord, and I pray that as they have heard the words of the gospel, that they will go home empowered and encouraged and convicted and ready for action that you equip the saints for every work of the ministry, Lord. And no matter where they are and where they stand, they will see you and they will teach you to everyone who is around because you are good and you are in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now before I dismiss you, I would like to um, pray over any offerings that you may have. And remember, we are doing it completely distanced-like. So on the way out, there's a little basket there that you can put it in. Or you can visit our website, ffichurch.com. And there you can also give tithes as well. And also, we are streaming our services. So if you know someone who hasn't been here in a little while and would like to hear this message, or you think, hey, someone needs to hear this message, please share it with them as well. We encourage you to do that. So again, I thank you all for being here. Let me just pray over you and pray over your offerings and say, give you thanks. Dear Lord, I just pray pray that as everyone leaves this building, uh, that they will have had, again, a foretaste of the kingdom, that when they are here, they see this community of saints gathered, and in doing so, they see a little bit of you on earth waiting for your return. I pray that anything that they give to this congregation will be used in ways that are honorable to you that we will be vessels of honorable use, Lord. And I just pray that everything that you do is for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now this comes from the book of Jude, and I will send you off. It says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. You are dismissed. If you need prayer, I will be out there. So will Pastor Mitchell. Feel free to come with us and we will talk to you there. Peace and grace to you all. Thank you.